Good evening, everybody. We're going to give everyone a few minutes and then we will get started with the webinar. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for everybody for joining us. We're just going to give us one more minute and then we're going to get started with our webinar this evening. Thanks for joining. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Conservation Federation of Missouri, I'm Tyler Schwartz, our Executive Director, and thank you for joining us for the Monarch Habitat, Habitat webinar this evening. We've got a great lineup of folks to visit with you and learn and interact and engage with, and so we're excited to have everybody here, and uh, we've got a great lineup, and I'm going to introduce those folks, and then I'm going to read our virtual meeting policy, and we'll get started with our presentations. And it certainly takes a lot of groups and partners and people to pull off such great things. And, and so we've got a great lineup here representing the National Wildlife Federation is Patrick Fitzgerald. Don Marie Duffin is here from Missourians for Monarchs. Colton Zirkel is our education and communications coordinator. He's behind the scenes and you'll see him a little bit later. He's helping coordinate everything logistically on the computers this evening. Wesley Swee is with Merrimack Spring Park. And Luke Anderson is representing the Missouri Department of Conservation. So to all of our panelists, thank you for, for joining us this evening and appreciate your time, talent, and certainly your expertise to share your knowledge with us. The CFM virtual meeting house rules are used to manage our virtual meetings of the Conservation Federation of Missouri, ensuring everyone has a chance to provide input and be received welcomely into an inclusive environment. Our virtual meeting of policy is committed to providing a safe, productive, and welcoming environment for all meeting participants. We have a zero tolerance policy for any form of discrimination or har harassment by participants, speakers, or staff at our meetings. Our full event virtual policy can be found on our website, and we'll post that link. To make a comment or ask a question, simply type it into the Q&A section located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please do not type it into the chat. The chat box will be monitored and questions will be filtered and responded in to the order that they were received. This meeting will also be recorded and made available on the CFM YouTube, YouTube channel at youtube.com slash confedmo. And with that, I will introduce our first speaker, which is Mr. Patrick Fitzgerald with the National Wildlife Federation. Take it away, Patrick. Thanks so much, Tyler, and uh, thank you to everyone who's um, joined us this this afternoon uh, to learn more about the monarch butterfly and um, ways that, that you can help uh, in, in your part of Missouri. Um, I'm just uh, getting my presentation up and we'll get that going. All right. Um, so again, um, my name is Patrick. Um, I uh, work on uh, monarch butterfly conservation and partnerships with uh, communities and municipalities uh, nationwide uh, related uh, to, to wildlife pollinators and the monarch butterfly. And I just wanted to share 
with you now a, a little bit of the the reasoning for this particular meeting, uh, especially knowing that there are many amazing groups who are on the the uh, the, the webinar with us tonight, and uh, a lot of folks focused on um, the this uh, monarch butterfly. But be, before I do that, I, I just want to share a little bit about the National Wildlife Federation. So um, we're a national organization, and we're working to unite all Americans to ensure that wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing world. And we do this uh, together with our state affiliates from coast to coast, um, working to protect wildlife and wild places uh, through um, just uh, many, many, many different programs, policy and advocacy, work in education. Um, we publish Ranger Rick Magazine and um, we're, we're doing a lot of different work and, and part of it is focus on monarchs and gardening and what uh, people can do, but uh, residents can do uh, to help wildlife on their own property and in their community. Um, so we have a Garden for Wildlife program that we've been um, running since, since 1973 to help think about those uh, smaller landscapes and gardens where you can uh, create habitat and make a difference for wildlife. Uh, we also run monarch uh, focused programs, including the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, which is helping communities uh, think about monarch conservation and, and helping residents learn how to, how to plant for the monarch and so forth. So um, we're, we're heavily involved in, in this work and have had uh, a tremendous partnership, obviously, with our state affiliate, the Conservation Federation of Missouri, and, and a lot of this work. And we have a, a project that we're working on currently um, with the Merrimack Spring Park and the James Foundation and, and partners in this part of Missouri. Uh, and it's roadside uh, monarch butterfly habitat. And um, th there's a big effort that I think Donna Marie is going to talk more about here in a minute, but there's uh, the monarch is, is in trouble and there's a need to create habitat and roadsides are a, a great opportunity uh, to create habitat. So there's 4.18 million miles of roadway in the United States. That's 17 times back and forth to the moon. Um, and, and it just means there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of potential acres of habitat um, along roadsides and, and lots of potential. And of course, there's um, setbacks for safety and there's certain areas that must be mowed, but there is um, a lot of room and um, our project is um, focused um, on the Ozark Highlands and the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas. So uh, we have a grant from the New York Community Trust um, to restore, enhance about 100 acres of habitat, 34 acres at Merrimack Spring Park, 75 acres in South Texas. And you might see this map more than once today, but you know we're talking about I don't know if you can see where I'm pointing, but down in, in Southern Texas and um, where you all are in Missouri, it's just, it's really important um, place for the monarch butterfly and its migration and ensuring we have uh, sufficient habitat. So in, in addition to uh, just working to create habitat on roadsides, uh, we also want to engage and support residents nearby that are interested in, in creating habitat as well. So that's, that's where this workshop is kind of coming into play. We want to share uh, more about the potential for roadsides and gardens and what you can do uh, to create habitat, learn a little bit more about Merrimack Spring Park, um, and lots of different uh, resources and opportunities from other partner organizations like Missourians for Monarchs and uh, Missouri uh, Department of Conservation and, and the other partners that are on this call. Um, and there, there's definitely opportunities uh, to do that if you have a, a stretch of roadside that you're looking to enhance um, or maybe mow less often and, and make some changes that would help monarchs. But we also, um, even small gardens, monarchs will find the milkweed, will find the habitat. So um, if you have a small garden uh, at your home, at school, elsewhere in the community, there's, there's definitely opportunities and a lot of need to uh, create habitat for the monarch. So the last thing I'll say about this project is um, we're, we're doing a, basically a pilot with Merrimack Spring Park and with uh, municipality and the State Department of Transportation in Texas. Once we finish those pilots, we're planning to share 
um, the findings and the lessons learned with the world. Um, and I mean, with the, the networks that we, we have through Garden for Wildlife, uh, cities that are doing uh, monarch work and try and encourage others to learn from what's happening um, in Missouri and, and share it and expand it and, and hopefully create more and more habitat. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna pass it over uh, to Donna Marie, who is with uh, Missourians for Monarchs, which is just an amazing organization uh, and collaboration working statewide to, to help save this monarch butterfly. So take it away, Donna Marie, thank you. Donna Marie, we cannot hear you right now. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> All I was asking is, can you see my screen at this point? Yes, we can. Okay, yep. perfect. Well, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for joining us. So, as Tyler previously noted, my name is Donnery Duffin. I'm the Monarch and Pollinator Coordinator with Missourians for Monarchs. And this afternoon, I'm actually here to chat with you about the monarch butterfly, obviously, but it's biology, migration, progress, the decline in population, and then I'll touch on the habitat requirements just a little bit. So to begin, I usually like to start with just a very quick overview of where monarchs are physically present across the globe, because most people don't realize that monarchs are actually present on six different continents. There were three distinct dispersal events that gave rise to the monarchs on those continents, which I will not go into in this presentation. But the key takeaway is that each of those populations is actually genetically diverse. And of course, we all know North America is one of those six continents that has monarchs present on it. But what a lot of people don't realize is that monarchs actually have existed in North America for 20,000 years. And they're actually, they actually are considered indigenous to North America. So within the North American population, we further divide that into two separate populations, Eastern and Western. So the Western population of monarchs are all of the monarchs located west of the Rocky Mountains. Eastern population is all of the monarchs, of course, located east of the Rocky Mountains. And we divide them in that way, not because they're genetically distinct, but rather due to their behavior patterns. And in particular, the fact that the Eastern population, which is the population we host here in Missouri, actually undergoes a pretty impressive migration process, which I will definitely dive deeper into later. But essentially, one thing to take away is that both the Eastern and Western populations are in decline. There's no difference there. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm gonna focus only on the Eastern population, since again, that's what we have here in Missouri. But I feel like I would be remiss now having said that Western population is in decline, not giving a few stats. So very quickly, um, for the Western population, the last count that was done, which was in November 2020, um, and it's done once a year, um, there were only 1,914 individual monarchs in that entire population, compared to 1.2 million individual monarchs that were counted in 1997, several years back, but still major drop. And overall, since the count began for the Western population, back in the 1980s, that population has actually declined by 99.9%. Now as for the Eastern population, we've not seen that much of a decline, but we have seen a 90% decline in just the past two decades. And this graph, which you're seeing on the screen, actually represents the number of hectares that are occupied by the monarchs in, in their overwintering habitat down in Mexico. That's how we count the Eastern population of monarchs. So as you can see from this chart, it's, it's pr it pretty clearly depicts a, a pattern of decline for the population. The most recent count, which was in February this year, 2021, showed the monarchs occupied only 2.1 hectares, which equates to, I think, around like 5.2 acres. And that's not a lot of space. That's also another decrease from the prior year. The prior, that's 25% decrease in particular. And the year prior to that, it was a 55% decrease. So again, not a great trend for the population. Now the overall goal for the Eastern population of monarchs is actually to, have to um, make it sustainable and to have a sustainable population. That means that it's gonna be able to rebound when it encounters various anomalies, like it's usually something to do with weather. 
um, like the major Texas storm that we had this year. That, and that did have an impact on the monarchs. We don't know how significantly yet, but we know there was an impact. Um, but the population, to be sustainable, needs to consistently occupy six hectares. And that, that goal, that you know, figure, was basically set or established back in 2014 or 2015. The date since that goal was set, we've only met that goal one year during 2018 and 2019 winter. Sorry, my slides aren't, aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing for me. But anyway, so contributing further to all the challenges, you know, that the monarch face is the fact that just surviving into adulthood is difficult enough. So like all, like all butterflies, the monarchs have a four-stage life cycle, egg, larva, pupa, adult. It only takes one month um, of the entire time period for the monarch to basically complete the first three stages. So from the time the egg is laid to the time that it actually emerges from its chrysalis, um, it only takes one month. Now the lifespan for the last stage for the adult monarch, that will depend on which generation, I'm putting that in air quotes because I'm gonna be diving deeper into that later. Um, but depending on which generation that monarch is will depend on how long the lifespan is, but it will range from either two weeks to two months or seven to nine months, which is a pretty big difference. slides are not cooperating. So milkweed is obviously required for the first stage egg because the female monarchs will only lay their eggs on milkweed plants. Um, and they tend to lay on the underside of the leaves, but not always. There are a few rebels out there, even with the monarchs. Um, but the eggs are absolutely very small in size. And I tried to highlight on the inset picture to the right-hand side um, to try to you know, call out how small they are, but they're about the size of a pinhead, basically. A female will typically lay around 100, 300 eggs, and they try to disperse them on different leaves of the plants, different milkweed plants, different locations of milkweed plants, but it's usually around 100 to 300 eggs. Um, but they do have the ability to do up to 500 eggs, and they can lay the, all 500 at one time if they decide to, basically. Now, the egg is the shortest stage in the life cycle. Once, the egg, once it's laid, it only takes four days for the egg to actually hatch. So after the egg is hatched and the caterpillar emerges from the eggs, then we're in the second stage. This stage lasts for about two weeks. Now, again, milkweed is required because the larvae will feed almost exclusively on milkweed during this stage. And the only time that the milkweed will differentiate and eat anything other than the milkweed is its very first meal after emerging from the egg. And that's the photo you see on the bottom right-hand corner. This is actually a photo of a monarch caterpillar after it's just emerged from its egg, basically partaking in its first meal, which is it eats the egg from where it just emerged. So that's what you're seeing. And then after that first meal, when his belly is full, caterpillar will go off and go in search of milkweed. And from that point forward, it will eat exclusively milkweed during the second stage. And it's going to eat a lot of milkweed, a lot of milkweed. During this stage, the caterpillar will have five different growth stages. Technically, they're called instars. Um, but essentially, it's where it molts. It's going to shed its skin to allow its body to grow further. And it needs to do that because overall, this larva will grow 3,000 times larger than the day it was hatched. And basically, the only job of a monarch caterpillar is to be fat and happy. That is its entire goal and job while it is in, it is in existence. So once that caterpillar is as fat and happy as he can be, then he'll start to start the process to move into the third stage, which is the pupa stage. So essentially the caterpillar is gonna seek out a secluded area as much as possible and begin the process of forming the chrysalis. Now, the caterpillar will hang upside down in a J shape and it's going to stay in this J shape for about 18 to 24 hours. So most of the chrysalis formation is actually occurring during the 18 to 24 hour time period underneath the skin. But most people think that the, that the chrysalis is being formed after that 18 to 24, when you see it like this video actually appearing. But what's actually happening, as I hope you can see in this video, it's really just shedding the skin again. So it's doing like its last molt of its skin, basically. 
But that's the reason why it appears like the chrysalis occurs in like 10 minutes when it really does take about 18 to 24 hours for that chrysalis to form. Now, after the chrysalis is formed, it's several hours uh, for it to basically harden. And during those hours, the monarch is, is basically very vulnerable to predation, damage, whatever could happen. But once it hardens, then the monarch will remain in that chrysalis for about 10 days. And during those 10 days, the full metamorphosis that, you know, all larvae, butterfly, whatever, that they all undergo. But 10 days, full metamorphosis, and then the adult will emerge. Now, around day eight or nine, the chrysalis will actually change color. It'll basically become clear. It doesn't change color. It becomes clear. It no longer is that jade green, and it goes to clear. So you can see the butterfly wings inside that chrysalis. And you know once you see that, so then a day or two, that's when the monarch is actually going to emerge. And once it emerges from the chrysalis, again, the monarch is vulnerable. So initially, the monarch will cling to the chrysalis shell while it's pumping the fluids from its abdomen into its wings, and then it has to allow the wings to dry after it pumps the fluid into them. So in the bottom, bottom right-hand picture, I've highlighted the one where, that shows how engorged that, that abdomen actually is and how small the wings are. Um, and then in the subsequent videos, the size of the abdomen shrinks, and of course, the wings increase as you would anticipate. But this process is another couple of hours. And again, during this time, the, mon the monarch is vulnerable. It cannot fly. So if it even falls, drops, gets blown off by wind, whatever, uh, it's, it's done for. Unless somebody's there and nicely puts it back up on something. Um, but once it takes flight, and once it has gone through all of this and it's made it to adulthood, then the adult monarch's only sole purpose is to reproduce. Unfortunately, once the monarch has finished reproducing, its lifespan pretty much ends very shortly thereafter. But the lifespan of the adult monarch, as I mentioned earlier, can vary depending on the generation. And it can either be two weeks to two months or seven to nine months, depending on which generation, I have to put that in quotes, it basically is born into. And that's because the monarch butterfly is the only known insect that will complete up to a 2,800-mile two, multi-generational migration. Sorry, and again, my, my slides just keep, keep doing this, but one thing to note is that the Eastern population of monarchs is the only population that actually undergoes this migration. So the Western population I mentioned earlier, they don't do it. To my knowledge, none of the other five, I guess it would be population of the other continents do it either. But the um, Eastern population for the monarch migration requires four to five generations to complete this one monarch, one, one migration cycle. And because Missouri is situated in the center for both the spring migration and the fall migration, we can actually host up to one to four generations during this entire process, which is why the habitat that we need to create here in Missouri is actually so important. But the, the way the migration process works is that during the fall months, um, that the um, last generation of monarchs make the entire southward journey down to Mexico. And that's where they're going to overwinter. They will spend the entire winter there. And they'll remain there until spring. In spring, when it warms up, they'll head north again. Now, remember, I mentioned the sole purpose of the adult monarch is just to reproduce, and that's it. So as soon as they can, they'll mate, and then they'll seek out milkweed to lay those eggs. And this will essentially complete their life cycle. Now, once those eggs are hatched, these eggs are considered the first generation. And this first generation continues its journey northward, again, seeking out mates and milkweed to create the next generation. And once that generation is hatched, which is usually mid to late spring, these eggs will now become the second generation. Generations two through four repeat this process until late summer, early fall sometime. And then generations one through four have the lifespan of two weeks to two months. It's the last generation that's hatched, which really can either be the fourth or the fifth generation, depending on environmental conditions that may be occurring that season. But that adult monarch generation has the seven to nine month lifespan because that last generation becomes the overwintering generation. And as I mentioned earlier, it will stay in Mexico from about November until the following March um, and they're able to accomplish this because they do something different than the other one through four, like one through four generations. As soon as this generation is hatched, they enter a phase known as diapause. 
diapause is just a fancy word that means that they reproductively, they go dormant. And that allows them to conserve all of that energy they would have otherwise expended on reproducing. They conserve all of that energy for their journey southward to Mexico, where again, they're going to remain until November, until the following March. In March, they'll head northward again. And then the entire migration cycle begins all over again. But that's, you know, four to five generations and basically an entire year. Um, and with that last generation seeking out mates and th that last generation, again, is going to be seeking out mates and milkweed to create the subsequent first generation. So, I mean, it's a pretty impressive cycle, in my opinion, anyway, but it is filled with like peril and dangers and challenges. And even in the best case scenario, a lot of things need to go right to be able to complete that migration cycle. And then when you add in all the external threats that monarchs face, such as the loss of habitat. And loss of habitat isn't just the milkweeds, which we really do hear most about, but it's also the nectar resources. Um, so the milkweed matters because as I previously stated, monarch caterpillars feed almost exclusively on the milkweed, but the adult females most definitely exclusively lay their eggs on the milkweed plant. So simply put, no milkweed, no monarchs. But the nectar resources are critical because they're needed to fuel the migration cycle. Without the adequate food, that last generation can't complete the flight to Mexico in the fall and then return again in spring. Monarchs do not feed while they overwinter in Mexico. They, on warm days, they flutter around. They sometimes take a drink from a spring, things of that nature. But essentially, all the food, all the nutrition, all the resources, they need to bulk up up here in the States before they head down to Mexico to overwinter. Now, indiscriminate use of pesticides and herbicides is also an issue. Now, there are times when pesticides and herbicides need, need to be used, but if we're gonna use them, then we just need to use them with best management practices in mind. And one of those is closely following the manufacturer's instructions. And this is, a, this is a time when more is not better. And then, you know, recommended quantities, dilution rates, things of that nature that are provided by the pr product manufacturers should be adhered to very, very rigidly. Um, one other best management practice would be don't spray on windy days, because obviously that's going to allow for a greater drift of the product, which could affect other plants that you didn't want to affect, other animal species, such as the monarch, other butterflies, other pollinators, things of that nature. And there's a lot that goes into the best management practices. So Missouri for Monarchs has, we do have several different best management practices up on our website because we created various best management practices based on the habitat type. So if you have row crops, we've got a best management practice. If you're grazing production, we have best management practices. If it's rural, non-ag, we've got it, or suburban, urban. So if you're interested and you want more information on things of that nature, you can go to our website and you can grab those best management practices from there. But another threat to them is actually, um, the, we call it mowing at inappropriate times. But they're, the inappropriateness is what we deem inappropriate for the monarch. Um, but if you know any cutting milkweed during the monarch peak usage, you know, not only reduces the milkweed that's available to them to lay their eggs, but if the, if the adult monarch has already laid her eggs in that area, now that milkweed is mowed or cut, clearly those eggs are no longer viable. Um, the recommended time for Missouri to mow, and this is specific to Missouri, is to mow prior to March 15th or after October 15th. And again, that's in the best management practices. So the last threat that has always been noted is illegal logging at overwintering sites. And this is a threat. However, Mexican authorities have really made significant progress at combating this threat. But, you know, diligence is still needed. But in truth, the reality is at this point, the population is so low that that's not, that's not the, the biggest threat that's, you know, that, that's on them. Um, believe it or not, um, weather anomalies, that is one of the bigger ones. Now, Climate change, we can call that whatever we want. We can say whatever causes climate change. None of that is what, what really matters at this point. It's the fact that something is making our climate change and that causes the weather anomalies that occur, such as, again, I mentioned the Texas freezing. Things of that have an impact. And from a um, graphic distribution or, or geographical distribution, that's one of the largest threats because when those types of events occur, um, it tends to take out a significant portion of the monarch population. 
So I figured I should at least touch on the listing while I'm uh, going through this presentation. So very, very quickly, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned back in August 2014 to list the monarch butterfly under the protections of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and in December, this past December 2020, they actually announced their decision, which is warranted but precluded. And what that means is that while there is a cause to list the monarch, positive strides are being made and there are other species who are more critical to becoming extinct because positive strides are not being made for them. Therefore, the monarch currently is not listed. However, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will regularly review the monarch status. It's yearly, basically, and it's in that paragraph um, on the screen, but they'll regularly review that. And then if it's deemed later that it needs to be listed, then it will be listed. Um, basically, if the positive strides we're currently making stop and we reverse and go the other direction, It'll probably get listed but during this time period when it's warranted but precluded it's considered a candidate species um so its status can change at any point in future years to become a fully listed species or as i mentioned if the positive strides continue the monarch population is deemed sustainable then it can completely be removed even as a candidate species and that's what we hope that there isn't a need for it to be listed so basically what you can do, the most important thing is create habitat. <laughs> um, and we need both, as I mentioned, the milkweed and nectar rich resources and native. That really is key. There's, I, I could go into another whole presentation, but I'm not going to because I don't have the time um, on essentially how long, um, or I'm sorry, essentially, you know, the requirements of the native versus cultivars, if you will. But the key is native and to have both milkweed and um, the nectarine resources. And especially, it's, it's critical here in Missouri because, again, we, we get both the spring and the fall migration because we're in their breeding range so that, and, and their migration route. So it, it's crucial to them because they need, obviously, breeding range. They need milkweed. During the migration route, they need the nectar resources to fuel that journey. So we really need both here. Now, there are typically 18 native milkweed species to Missouri. You're only going to be able to find seven or eight of them readily available through commercial resources. And I've listed those on the screen for you, which is basically your butterfly milkweed, common, green, prairie, purple, swamp, which is also sometimes called marsh, and then world milkweed. They're pretty readily available. Um, something to consider is growing conditions. Most people don't really think about this when it comes to milkweed because Milkweed is a weed by some people, so they think, oh my God, it'll grow anywhere. Unless you want it to grow, then it won't. But as with any plant you grow, you really do need to pay attention to water and light requirements because purple milkweed needs to have some level of shade. Now, world milkweed likes afternoon shade, but it can sustain in full sun, but you're gonna have to water it a little bit more. Swamp milkweed needs like wet soil, swampy, it's why it's called swamp or marsh. Swamp, you know, swampy soils, but it requires full sun. So to me, that's challenging my yard, so I can't have swamp milkweed. But some milkweeds also grow more aggressively than others, and they're going to spread very easily, like common milkweed. This is great if you're planting an entire field, but if you're planting suburban urban garden, then you're probably going to want to devise some kind of a plan to control common milkweed growth or just plant another milkweed variety, such as butterfly, green, or purple, those three tend to not spread aggressively at all. They, pre, they stay pretty localized. Um, they'll naturalize, but they don't spread, essentially. Um, but then also keep in mind that, you know, the milkweed plants, like a lot of plants, they have varying heights, and they range literally from one to two feet all the way up to, like, I think it's, I know it's five feet, but I think one of them is up, goes up as high as uh, six feet. And one key, key, key aspect of any successful pollinator, we'll say garden, plot, landscape, whatever you want to call it, is a variety of plants. Research repeatedly has shown monarchs are more likely to visit areas with more than one type of milkweed present, as well as other nectar-rich resources there with the milkweed. So it's one-stop shopping as far as they're concerned. Um, so really, the key is variety of plants if you want to, you know, go, go that route. But, you know, because habitat is the key in helping these monarchs, and I'm only, like I said, I'm only touched and, and just, you know, tip of the iceberg here for habitat. The next presentations are really going to dive a lot deeper into habitat, habitat creation. 
um, and basically give you more of the information that you're looking for. And that is going to start with Wes Sweet. Can you, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to share my screen and get started here. All right, how are we doing? We do not see you or your screen yet. Uh oh. Anything? Nothing? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. All right, how are we doing now? We see you, but we not your you. screen. Come on, computer. Getting better? We're almost there. Just need to get into the presentation. All right. How's that? Perfect. All right. Sorry, guys. Uh, thank you, uh, Donna Marie, for that presentation. That was awesome. Um, I am the director of the James Foundation and Merrimack Spring Park. And it is our mission to manage and maintain Merrimack Spring Park for the enjoyment of all the people that come out to see us. Uh, I'm going to touch on kind of a little bit about the park, its history, and how we got into the monarch habitat uh, scene. So I don't think uh, many would disagree that uh, Merrimack Spring Park is one of the most beautiful places here in Missouri, and uh, it's home to the fifth largest spring in the state of Missouri. Uh, this is a picture that was taken last fall. Uh, you can see how, how pretty it is. There's many amenities and activities for people that come to the park. We have uh, a cafe, store, camping, hiking, fishing, picnic areas, uh, shelters. Uh, a lot of people come out here for reunions, uh, playgrounds, and museums. So lots to do out here at Merrimack Spring Park. Uh, it's had a long history. Uh, it was first uh, uh, settled in 1826 as an ironworks when they discovered an iron mine and started using Merrimack Spring for the water power. And that lasted for about 30, 40 years. Uh, eventually, the, the last descendant of the James family, James family bought back her property in the 1920s. And uh, she tried to keep it in operation. And unfortunately, in, with her passing in 1938, uh, she created the James Foundation, and we've been managing and maintaining the park ever since. So in 1958, we made an agreement with Missouri Department of Conservation to start stocking rainbow trout on a regular basis here at Merrimack Spring Park. Uh, we utilize about seven tenths of the spring branch and stock around 120,000 rainbow trout each year. We get about 58,000 visitors to to just come and do trout fishing. So it's very popular um, and uh, it's something for everybody to enjoy. So uh, you may be asking, how did the uh, Merrimack Spring get onto this uh, pollinator initiative? Well, uh, we were approached about three years ago by the Xerxes Society as a potential candidate for developing some monarch habitat at uh, the park. And this, this is what kicked off our um, Merrimack Spring Park Pollinator Initiative. Um, coming from, the, from uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation in my prior uh, place of employment, uh, I spent 17 years there. It didn't take much to twist my arm to get onto this, uh, get on board with this project, but sometimes your board members need a little extra justification. So uh, 
we saw Merrimack Spring as the park had plenty of land available. Uh, of our 1800 acre park, the public really only uses about a fraction of that. We also had the staff to implement and interpret the, uh, the project. We have resources and equipment to get the job done. And, and just like uh, Donna Marie touched on, the location of Merrimack Spring was ideal for this project because we are right in the Eastern migration route northward. Uh, here is a outline of our uh, aerial map of Merrimack Spring Park. Blue line represents our boundary. So we have about 1860, 1860 acres uh, of park. As you can see here, the shaded purple areas are, are what were historically hay fields at Merrimack Spring Park. And then that's primarily cool season grasses, which is great if you're a farmer and you're putting up hay or you have cattle, but it's not so ideal if you're a monarch butterfly. So this is when we jumped, jumped after the opportunity to start creating some potential pollinator habitat. So I worked with uh, one of our private lands conservationists from the Missouri Department of Conservation, Luke Anderson, and together we mapped out about 150 acres of potential pollinator habitat. Uh, after we did that, we quickly uh, contracted a farmer to start planting soybeans out here at the park. And you're probably asking yourself, why, why did we start planting soybeans instead of wildflowers? Well, this was a kind of a preparation step before we started planting wildflowers. You plant soybeans, the farmers are very good at that. It kills the grass, the existing grass. And when they harvest it, it leaves a clean slate for your wildfire seed to be put down on the ground. For this uh, roadside monarch habitat project, we selected fields four and six of the 100, 150 acres that were out there. And this is right along Highway 8. So it's right next to the roadside, very visible for people to see. Uh, and this fall, we're, we've just reached our second year of soybean uh, production. And when the farmer harvests those beans, uh, we will be four acres of uh, monarch, a monarch mix, which is, uh, you know, contains milkweed plants and also nectar about a couple dozen nectar producing uh, uh, flowers and plants. The, uh, the unfortunate thing with uh, doing a seeding project like this is that uh, patience is key. You'll hear that again and again, and there's a waiting time. So you'll hear this uh, phrase when you talk about wildflower seedings is that the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. So that's the hardest part when you do projects like this is the waiting game. So uh, if you wanna see a sneak peek of what these fields are gonna look like in the future, we planted one two years ago and we're just starting to see a lot of color uh, uh, show up in, the, in this field right at, right at the entrance of the park. So all of these pictures were taken on our flowers that we, we found out there this year. So. It's looking good, you just have to be patient. And uh, with that, I'm gonna kick it back over to Patrick and they're gonna show you guys uh, the kind of the specifics and the technical details on how to initiate a project like this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wes, that was great. And I'm just, bringing my presentation back up. So bear with us one moment as we transition. All right, can everyone see my slide okay? Yes, sir, it looks good. Thank you, everyone's quietly or on mute saying yes, that's good. Um, so, um, well, so it was really great to get a sense of uh, Merrimack Spring Park and, um, you know, from the fishing to the, the monarch uh, habitat that you all have been, been planning for such a long time. It's exciting to see those photos of, of it uh, paying off and excited to put 34 more acres in the ground this fall. It's, it's really exciting. 
Um, so in, in this next section, um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, habitat requirements and how you might go about getting a garden or a small habitat started. Um, for those of you that might be interested in, um, in that approach, what monarchs need, how to provide that um, in your garden. And then I'm going to turn it over to Luke Anderson next with Missouri Department of Conservation, who's going to share a little bit more about uh, roadsides and uh, seeding and perhaps larger um, habitat areas. So let me um, dive right in. I'm going to start like truly with the basics. Donna Marie started talking about native plants and, um, you know, there's an hour presentation just on on the importance of natives, but uh, we're we're not going to go there. I'll just give you a couple minutes. So. Um, for our programs, you know, plants are really um, the foundation for habitat, for the food web and in, in any ecosystem. So we talk a lot about plants um, and, and how important they are, and especially native plants. And this is true, you know, in urban, suburban, or rural areas. And, you know, insects are the next step up from those plants in, in the food web. And this is an important connection because about 90% of insects rely on plants um, and can only survive on plants with which they evolved. So um, many, many species have evolved for millennia with, uh, with native plants. And if you take them out or if invasives come in, um, it can really have an impact. So um, we, we really focus on, on native plants for that reason. You take it one, one step further <laughs> uh, in the food web and, and backyard birds rely on those insects. So if you don't have the insects, you, or if you don't have the native plants, you are not likely gonna have the insects. And um, even looking beyond uh, that monarch butterfly caterpillar, um, insects, including caterpillars of many moths and, um, and butterflies are important uh, food for bird and other wildlife that you might be interested in attracting to your property or to your garden. Um, and native plants are really, really key uh, to this. So again, native plants are adapted to local soils, uh, your precipitation, um, they're resilient and hardy once they're established. So, um, you know, make no doubt about it. You can't just plant it and leave it alone. It's not, <laughs> native plants aren't that magical, but once they do get established, um, they, they are a lot more um, resilient. And, and native plants uh, support more wildlife. It's, it's just that simple. Um, so a, a common example um, that I love is that an oak uh, tree um, supports 557 different species uh, of caterpillars, and it might be thousands or tens of thousands, even more than that, of, of caterpillars in a large oak tree. Um, a ginkgo supports zero caterpillars. A ginkgo isn't uh, indigenous to in the United States. So um, this is based on research from the University of Delaware uh, by entomologist Doug Tallamy, but it, it's really important what we plant. Um, and that, um, really native plants are, are the basis of a monarch garden um, and all wildlife gardens or, or landscapes that you might be wanting to put in. So we have, uh, through our Garden for Wildlife program, we, we really focus on uh, what wildlife need to, to survive and thrive. And that's uh, food, water, cover, and places to raise young. So I'm gonna walk through that um, quickly for the garden setting uh, before I turn it over to Luke. So, um, for food, um, and Donna Marie's covered this <laughs> um, very well, which is um, monarchs basically need native milkweed and they need native nectar plants. Um, so again, the, the young are only gonna lay eggs, or excuse me, the butterflies are only gonna lay eggs. Caterpillars are gonna eat that, the milkweed plant. Um, it's important in your garden to think about a mix of uh, native wildflowers or nectar plants so that um, you can support the monarch butterfly during its entire adult um, life cycle. So you want something, you know, maybe when it's migrating north in, in May or June, um, you, you want to have flowers that are in bloom then, and that would also be in bloom, uh, perhaps different species in, in late summer or early fall. So that's, that's really important, um, and, and the plants are the most important thing um, you can do for the monarch. Um, Donna Marie talked about milkweed uh, species that are native in Missouri. Some are here, including the 
butterfly weed and the the common milkweed and the green and so these are these are beautiful plants so no one's going to be sad to see these in your garden um, or wherever you are they're they're really um, striking blooms they're gorgeous plants um, and there are different native varieties um, one thing that we are, are very um, adamant about is that um, we're, it's important not to plant tropical milkweed. And again, this is a whole nother presentation. Um, if you have tropical milkweed in your garden, you shouldn't feel bad about it. Any, any milkweed is good, but we discourage people um, from planting tropical milkweed because it can foster disease and it can negatively impact uh, the monarch butterfly's migration. Um, so um, if you can, at all possible, we want to steer clear of tropical and, and look for those uh, native milkweeds. And we'll have some resources later um, to help you find uh, that, that kind of milkweed. So another thing um, that if you're planting a garden um, and really looking to attract a lot of uh, butterflies, um, a water source is, is important for, um, for insects and butterflies, including monarchs. So, um, Insects and butterflies are not going to come to a bird bath or drink directly out of a pond. So they need a, a shallow lead into some water. Uh, these bees are drinking out of effectively a puddle. Um, on the other side, you see a puddling dish that's created with some stones and water. Um, a lot of times, uh, butterflies are just going to access water um, and minerals uh, through uh, wet soil. So a little Sandy or, or muddy patch is is perfect for <laughs> for a butterfly garden. Um, if you have room there and you, you don't mind a um, you know a little spot like that in your garden. Um, so these are all things that that monarch butterflies need. And it, it is also true that um, sustainable gardening is really important. So um, and the the main thing there is not to use pesticides in gardens. So I I think. We understand that there are times with invasive species or managing, especially large landscapes, where uh, pesticides or herbicides are, are part of the part of the picture to get the work done and to have good habitat. It just is um, is needed at times. But typically in gardens and small landscapes, um, pesticides are not needed, and especially systemic pesticides, which are pesticides that are um, basically in the, the leaves of the plant. If, if monarchs eat uh, milkweed that's treated with uh, systemic pesticides, they're, they're gonna die. And um, so, you know, it's kind of contrary <laughs> to the purpose of gardening for monarchs and wildlife. So especially in your garden and especially on those plants that you're planting, especially for the monarch, um, we want to be careful um, to, to not use pesticides or herbicides in, in the garden. Again, in larger landscapes, um, in, in certain situations, it, it may be uh, a, different, uh, a different story. So um, my last slide here is that if you do have a garden for wildlife um, or you've created a monarch garden, I encourage you to check out our website, nwf.org slash garden. Um, together with Conservation Federation of Missouri um, and, and National Wildlife Federation, um, you can earn recognition for your garden um, and get assigned for being a certified wildlife habitat um, for having that food, water, cover, and places to raise young. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Luke, who's going to um, talk about um, other ways to create habitat on your property. Thanks. Okay, we'll stop the share. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, now that you have seen uh, some of the other presentations and, and maybe you've seen some pollinator habitat out there before, uh, now you want to know, hey, how can I get some of that on, on my uh, property or, or what are the steps that we might need to go through to, to get that out there. So that's what we're going to discuss here um, in this presentation and uh, uh, kind of break it down in Monarch Habitat Establishment and kind of break it down into uh, three categories there. There's really site prep is the first uh, most important thing uh, right off the bat. And then seeding, um, the actual seed, seed mix itself, how you go about that. And then, and then maintenance after 
the seeds on the ground through those uh, first few growing seasons and, and, and so on. Uh, as Wes, I believe, mentioned earlier, patience is key. Uh, as a little background on myself, I'm a private lands conservationist. Um, for those of you that don't know what that is, um, we're with Missouri Department of Conservation and we are assigned to, I've got Phelps and Pulaski counties, but I meet with landowners and discuss wildlife habitat improvements on their property. Um, and I'm often asked about monarch habitat and you know, sometimes it's a little shocking for, I didn't say little, sometimes it's most all the time, it's just a little shocking for, uh, for folks to kind of understand how, how much of a process it is and how long it actually takes uh, as Wes alluded to earlier. So, um, but with that, we'll start with uh, site prep. And also we'll be giving kind of this talk on preparation kind of goes along the lines with my job as a, uh, private lands conservationist and, and dealing with some of the federal and state programs there are to establish monarch habitat. So uh, basically this, this is kind of how we do it, a, a, the quickest way we, we can um, to try to get it done in a year's time and get the seed on the ground in, a, in that, for, in that uh, one year time from when you start this site prep. So a uh, big thing with site prep, uh, bare soil is definitely key to, to the process you know, these seeds have to make good seed to soil contact. When you throw it out there on the ground, if that seed's not touching the soil, um, odds are it's not going to germinate and, and you're, you've kind of wasted your time and money. So uh, bare soil is key. We want it, uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, there's definitely at least 60% bare soil there. That's kind of a minimum I look for uh, when, when talking with folks about, about planting. Um, Definitely, if you were to take seed out there and throw it on this ground, it's odds are it's going to make contact with the soil. And it's also very fairly smooth. That's, that's another important factor. These seeds are very small. Um, you know, you, it's not going to take much of a crack for them to fall into or uh, get under a big clot of dirt or something like that. And they're just simply not going to sprout. So um, we want it fairly smooth. Um, and then should be should be good. But, you know, if if uh, if you had to, maybe uh, if say things did look a little rough, you can you can always roll it uh, with a roller or a culture packer if you have it, or if it's a smaller area, drive around on it, kind of smash it down first, and then and then throw the seed on top. So, a uh, big question always is how do we get uh, this bare soil? Um, and it really kind of depends on what you're working with. So we're gonna start with sod forming grasses, as, as Wes mentioned, they had there at the park. Uh, that's going to be things like fest, most commonly in our area, fescue, um, brome could be as well, but uh, typically in this area, it's going to be fescue. Um, for that, we're going to start minimum of two sprains in the spring and the fall. So we will start in the spring. You'll go in there like in March, uh, get a good spray on there, kill what you can, as you can see in these picture. And as often as the time, there's a few green strips out there with the sprayer. Uh, miss, but that gives you time to go back, hit those if you need to. Um, watch for other things that might sprout during the summer. Uh, if it's something you need to address, address it through the summer and then look at if the fescue comes back, because it is very tough to kill. Um, maybe start again in, uh, or look again at spring, maybe in October, uh, somewhere there in the fall and, and watch for clover. Clover is uh, kind of a nemesis for us uh, when it comes to planting pollinator habitat as you We'll find if you get out any hay pasture, and, and as you all may know, fescue is typically always mixed with clover. Uh, sometimes it, it even suppresses it a little bit, and so you'll have a lot of clover seed out there, and when you remove the fescue, you will get a, a flush of clover growth. Uh, clover is somewhat beneficial to wildlife and even in pollinators, uh, but it will choke out the seed, seedlings that, uh, that you've thrown out as they start to grow. And, uh, and once it's there, you know, you get into the broadleaf specific herbicide versus the grass specific, or uh, there's just no way to get rid of it once your uh, pollinator plants are growing. So uh, we wanna address that before the seed gets down. Uh, if you end up having uh, some undesirable warm season plants, which was a little bit of the case with the James Foundation, uh, a lot of Johnson grass or ECLS Bediza, things like that, definitely address those first. Uh, unfortunately, you know, if it's really bad, it, it may be something as, as much as saying, hey, take a couple of years and just treat this whatever means necessary. Um, I have here crops, you know, like the soybeans can be used and that's, that's what uh, the James Foundation elected to go with there in their situation. 
Um, one, because it's going to get multiple treatments because uh, the farmers really don't want that stuff in their crops. And uh, it leaves you uh, better off in the end when you do finally start, start the actual seeding process. Every once in a while, say you're on the complete opposite end of that with the, uh, with the unwanted warm season stuff. Say you have a bunch of good native warm season grasses. Uh, you could also can plant, uh, plant pollinator habitat through those. A uh, big thing with those will be to uh, burn them prior to the seeding, uh, say in December or January. I'd say do it as close as possible to right before you're going to seed as you can. Um, this is going to expose bare soil, which is going to get you that good seed to soil contact. Uh, and due to the clumpy nature of growth of those native grasses, it will allow those forbs to come up in between. But if they're the taller grasses, like in this picture with the big blue stem, you know, you may have to do some mowing as well that first year just to keep them from uh, shading out the, the new growth quite so much. And this, anytime I'm asking about planting anything, and it's just kind of our, uh, our nature because it's what we're used to, they ask about disking, should I disk? Um, and the answer to that will almost always be no, if possible. Um, one, one situation that you might, might want to disk would be if, uh, say you say you didn't have a way to get rid of a thick layer of grass there and you killed it, um, how are we going to get that bare soil exposed? If, if prescribed fire is something you're not overly comfortable with, then disking may be okay. Uh, but again, a couple of notes there, disking, it does turn up the seed bank. Uh, so you may have a lot of seed that you don't want out there. It may cause more sericea or more unwanted plants to, uh, to germinate. Um, you also, if not rolled before, like I talked about in, in the bare soil slide, uh, you can risk seeding a lot of this seed too deep. And so, uh, so if, if you can, uh, rollers aren't something a lot of people have access to anymore, but if possible, uh, cultivate that soil prior to seeding. And so now uh, we'll transition into the seeding part of it. These seeds kind of takes people a little bit by surprise, but when you're doing a seeding like this, they will be seeded during the dormant season. And here in Missouri, that's typically going to be probably uh, somewhere in that December 1st through February 15th. I really, I would pref prefer seeing that December and into maybe January 15th even. Um, just the earlier, the better. A lot of the seeds will need uh, several days of um, freezing and thawing action to kind of scarify the seed and get them to germinate that year. So it's good to get them out there as early as possible. And uh, some different methods there, there are really two, uh, broadcasting the seed, and that is by far the preferred method uh, from my experience. Uh, if possible, uh, whether you have dissed the seed or not, we talked about cultipacking before you seed, but even if you haven't, uh, if you can cultipack after you seed, that's great, but if not, uh, at least just get it out there on the ground and, and let that freezing and thawing action kind of take course. And, uh, and work it in the ground a little farther as well. Uh, you will need to mix the seed with a carrying agent. And what I mean by that, you can see the ATV seeder on the, in the picture there on the right. That is uh, something that can be used very easily and, and a lot of people have, but mix the seed with something like pelletized lime or uh, I've heard of people using sawdust or just anything you can get that will keep it mixed up and, and, and help it come through that cedar um, at a more even rate. So this, the seeds are very small, like I said, they do fall through those uh, openings in those uh, cedars very quickly. And, and we've had more than one case where people have <laughs> dumped a lot of money's worth of seed out in a very short amount of time. So we wanna keep them, uh, keep it mixed up, keep it uh, to where you know you can get over the whole field. And, uh, just remember also that if you do mix it with something like pelletized lime, it's a little heavier, a little, little bigger, you're gonna see that flying out all both directions from that cedar uh, hitting the ground. Just know that your seed's probably not going quite that far. So you wanna keep your, your passes a little closer together. Uh, you may feel like you're really overlapping, but that's probably what you need to do to get a good even seed seeding down. Uh, No-till drill is on there. For those of you who don't know what, what that is, uh, it's often used with more of a crop and pasture type setting, but uh, it is kind of a nice machine because as you can see in the bottom picture, it's gonna plant things in about six to seven inch rows, depending on the machine. It's gonna do it all in one pass. So you get bare soil and you just, or even, even that can cut through a slight layer of dead grass if, if it's still on there. 
but you just run it over one pass it, and, and it sets the seed out. And then it has kind of a small roller culti packing wheel that comes over behind it and presses it into the ground. The downsides and why we don't use that with, uh, with a lot of pollinator plantings is just that it is very hard to adjust that seeding rate and get it right. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, calibrating. You can do it. Um, only good thing it is easy to see kind of where you've been, especially if it's a larger field. So most time, the times that I've had uh, landowners that have done this, it's been on a, a fairly large field. Um, the downside, though, it is it's very easy to get the seed too deep. So they roll across the ground, but when they come up on a hump, you know nothing's perfectly flat out there, uh, especially in Missouri. Uh, that seed can get buried too deep. So uh, you just want to be very careful with it. Make sure you're really almost. Uh, just putting the seed almost just on top of the ground. You're really not even putting it, uh, cutting into the dirt hardly at all. And, and you might need to mix it with a carrying agent through that as well, just to keep that seed uh, from falling out too fast. Uh, so seed mixes, uh, this is gonna be probably a little bit of confusing information if you read through this, but this are, our seed mix guidelines that if we're going through one of our federal or state programs, uh, these are the minimum requirements for that. But I thought I would throw them on there because as Donna Marie talked and Patrick and, and everyone, there's, it's not just about milkweed. Uh, you need to have a, 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 as diverse a mix as possible and uh, have those nectaring plants in there as well. So, so minimum requirements for ours real quick, um, 20 species is the minimum and at least three in each bloom period, spring, summer, and fall. So that way you've got something that starts in the spring and you've got something blooming all year long. Not only does it help provide the uh, maybe nectar needs for, for pollinators throughout the summer, but it also, um, it also um, is more aesthetically pleasing to the landowner out there. Uh, you know, if everything blooms at once and you have a long period of time where maybe it's just green or, or something blooms and dies off and it's not as pretty. So it keeps the aesthetic value up as well. And, you know, you can see on the pictures on the left, there are uh, the top picture there with the Indian paintbrush blooming. That's like probably late May. Um, and while it's not in the same place on the same field, but that is the same field in July with all of the blazing star blooming. And after the blazing star goes, then it tends to transition into a lot of the sunflowers and are more of our late summer or fall blooming things, which are more yellow in color. Uh, minimum 15 to 30 seeds per square foot. They have switched a lot of our, our uh, seeding rates from pounds per acre down to uh, seeds per square foot in an effort to diversify seed mixes and cut down cost. And, and I think it has done that uh, fairly well. Um, minimum 3% milkweed uh, from at least two different species of which two thirds has to be common and a third either butterfly world uh, spider on well-drained soils or the swamp milkweed on less well-drained soils. And then um, minimum 60% of at least six species must come from the preferred Forbes for Monarch list. So there is out of all the approved Forbes that we have that you're allowed to use through one of these programs, we do have, um, oh, they've just increased it, but about, it's about a page and a half of, four, of Forbes that are specifically uh, preferred by monarch butterflies. And so we do have to have a minimum uh, percentage come from that. Uh, and then you get into no you know, maximums on annuals and biannuals. Um, we don't want one single species being more than 10% or less than 0.1%. A lot of that just goes to making sure we have a good diversity. Um, you can add some native grasses into some of these mixes. And, and we do, uh, I do recommend it on larger fields for sure. Uh, you start getting into things over a couple of acres in size and you know prescribed fire is going to be a, a really good way to maintain these and you know when when these forbs kind of die back in the winter time there's not a lot left there to burn so the grass does help carry fire and also helps with some other uh, aspects of uh, maybe for ground nesting birds and things like that so and then the seed must come from a spec uh, specified seed source geography uh, contains all the states of Missouri, Illinois, and Iowa, and then parts and said different, several counties from all the other states uh, surrounding us. Uh, we get into maintenance. You know, you've got your seed on your ground. Um, I'll try to remember Wes's quote there, but the first year it creeps. So uh, on uh, 
I'm sorry, it sleeps on the first year. <laughs> so it's not going to get very tall. You know, if, you, if you've ever paid, ever seen it or paid, played, paid close attention to it, um, it's only going to grow maybe three, four, five, six inches at most uh, that first year. It, it's putting all its stuff into roots and it's putting a good, good root system down. So then the next year it can really take off. And so really the big thing with uh, first year maintenance is going to be mowing it. And, and by that, typically, I mean, brush hog, uh, most, most mowers will not go over six inches and that's probably okay for the first cutting. But after that, we really don't want to cut it any shorter than eight inches if possible. So uh, mow it every time it gets about knee high. Um, is an easy way to walk out there and say, hey, do I need to cut this or not? Well, is it knee high? Let's cut it uh, and cut it back to eight inches. If, uh, you know, I would just be really careful not to go any shorter than that after that first cutting, because you don't want to be uh, at that stage in their life without a big root system. You don't want to be cutting the tops off any. Um, and so it depends on the weather, how often you're going to have to do that. We may, you may have to do it uh, two times, or you might have to do it four or five times. It really, if we get in a real heavy rain year, it might just keep coming back, but uh, probably average, just expect to do it maybe two or three times. And then if, uh, and, and really try to stick to that knee high, if it gets much higher than that, then you, you will see a, a fairly thick layer of duff get put down on the ground and that, that can go, uh, or that can be pretty bad for the, the small seedlings and choke them out. Uh, it does seem to happen overnight. I, I run into this problem quite often uh, in working with landowners is that, uh, you know, it may be a place, either a farm they're not at every day, they don't live there, so they don't see it all the time. And, you know, maybe it was halfway between their knee and their ankle when they left and they come back, you know, after a rain and some, some sunshine and three or four days later, and it's all the way over knee high, you know. So if that's the case, you know, it's something to think about, look about, you might be better off just to leave it at that point rather than cut it. Uh, but each each field would would have to be looked at differently there. Uh, move over to second year, so uh, it's going to creep that second year. Uh, you mow it early if you need to. Knock if you get a, a an early flush of uh, growth that might shade it out. Uh, and in this situation, it'd probably just have to be something really really thick. But go ahead and mow it back, and and watch for invasive unwanted species. You know you're always going to have some grasses probably that you don't want come back from seed. You're going to have things like sericea get in there um, if even if you had it killed out perfectly, there's going to be animals carry seed around. So just watch for that stuff, jump on it early and take care of it. So you don't have to, uh, you know, end up dealing with a huge problem later on. And you should definitely see more color that year. Um, definitely more than year one. Uh, some of the annuals might be in there. They might flower year one is just to let you know that, uh, Hey, there is something out there, but uh, yeah, you should see some more color year two. Uh, post second growing season, uh, maintenance, really, if, if you're comfortable with it, prescribed burning is going to be your number one option there. It's the easiest, fastest, most effective way and uh, most cost efficient way to, to do anything uh, maintenance wise. Uh, burn it every one to three years. I mean, I, a lot of people burn these things every year. You know, uh, you just really want to watch for you're also in Missouri, you're probably going to have some woody vegetation start to come in and things. So you're going to want to keep that stuff killed back and fire will do a great great season for that. Typically, it's going to be dormant season sometime in, uh, from December through uh, February. Um, it also cleans the slate, you know, after things die back in the wintertime. It's, I, I recommend leaving as much of it as long as possible for some wintertime cover for other animals. But if you do have to, uh, or, or you just really don't like the way it looks, you know, you can burn that off uh, in the winter and then it clean, kind of cleans that slate and, and starts it over again. And, uh, I mentioned it sets back woody encroachment, but if burning's not an option, uh, brush hogging can be done. Um, as Donna Marie mentioned, you know, mowing or anything like that, where it's going to be something done in the dormant season, winter time, uh, let everything get as much use out of those plants as they possibly can. Uh, and why you, it, it can be done. And I've seen some fields that uh, maintain some diversity, you know, it, you might lose a little diversity over time without burning, but um, you know, mowing, mowing is a, a decent second option if, if that's what you got. So that really wraps up the uh, kind of the seeding, maintenance, site prep, all that stuff. Uh, there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, talk a little bit about that for just a second on how to, uh, you know, if you're wanting to do this or want more information on monarchs and, and monarch seed and things like that. Um, this slide 
I've listed several here, the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Uh, you got the website there, Missourians for Monarchs. Um, you can get some milkweed plugs from uh, Monarch Watch. Um, and then of course, for me, what I deal with most would be Missouri Department of Conservation and, and our private land conservationists do cover every county for technical advice. So even if you're not in Phelps or Pulaski County, there is a private lands conservationist that would be happy to talk with you on, on things. Um, the cost share programs we work with are uh, the EQIP being the federal program and, and, and then our MDC program. Um, you know, if you want more information, we'd sure be happy to talk with you on that as well. And what those are, just real quick, they're, they're not a, they're a reimbursement program. So where if you uh, um, put the seed out there, you have to sign up for them first and get approved, but then you plant the seed and then we reimburse you some of the cost for doing that. Uh, Quell Forever as well. They also have Quell Forever biologists that are very similar to PLCs. Uh, they they aren't as scattered throughout the state as what the PLCs are, but uh, you know they they do offer technical advice and help sign people up for programs as well. They they do some good youth pollinator habitat programs and schools and and getting some seed out in some places. And uh, you can check that out at quellforever.org. But and then. Uh, Try and maybe be in the works on getting some seed for, for everyone that attended today. So just check back in uh, with Merrimack Spring uh, and someone they may mention more about it later, but maybe in October or November and, and see if we can get some uh, little packet of wildflower seed for you. Uh, as far as seed goes, there are some, some uh, quite a few native seed dealers in Missouri, actually. Uh, what I deal with through my program, typically these four are, are, are right up there with probably by far the most used and probably will have the most selection of seed. Um, but there's a list there, uh, different different ones uh, with their, their info and contact info. And then you can also uh, find more options at uh, grownative.org. They actually have a grow, grow Native resource guide that lists all the ones in the state and, and what services they offer. With that, there's my contact info. If you are in Phelps, or Phelps County or around here and need to get in touch with me, feel free uh, anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. That was a great presentation. Um, thank you to all the presenters. We really appreciate you guys uh, being on here and sharing your wealth of knowledge on the subject. Uh, we have had a few questions and we may get back into the, some of those that Donna Marie have answered if we have some more time. Uh, but for those who are still on, go ahead and send your questions in to the chat there or into the Q&A and we will get to those in the order they are received. So Luke, uh, the first one I have is for you. Um, is MDC, you kind of touched on it there at the end, is MDC mm -hmm. selling seed mixes for yards that are less than an acre? We do not sell seed mixes typically, well at least for me personally, I, I've never had any seed mix to give out to anyone. Um, but size, you know, size doesn't matter when it comes to some of those programs and, and things like that. Uh, you know, they, they do like to kind of see a minimum of a half acre, um, but you know, we could, we could definitely talk and work with folks. And sometimes we do get some seed um, with some leftover money and things. So there might be an option there that we could get some to you for a smaller, smaller plot. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is from Jim. And I'm not sure who would be best suited to answer this one, so you guys can uh, discuss that. But Jim asked, are roadside areas a threat for the butterflies? Wouldn't areas like cemeteries and parks be safer? So I can take that one if nobody else wants to. <laughs> um, right so ahead. the short answer is, Yes, the cemeteries and parks would actually be safer. There has been some research, some research done that shows that roadside, um, because of collisions and whatnot, which is I'm sure what you're referring to, Jim, um, that you know certain areas can become a sink, what's called a you know a, a habitat sink, because more are killed than it helps. However, um, in general, when you're looking at roadside habitat, um, and I think it was uh, Patrick mentioned it initially. There's just so many miles of it that is unused. And it, it just, one, it's an eyesore when it's not properly maintained. Two, it's a lot of money for the Department of Transportation to maintain them. 
and it's wasted space where we need every bit of habitat that we can possibly get for the monarchs and pollinators, so why not use it? And like Patrick mentioned, there are certain setbacks you know, that you try to use and you, you employ and, and whatnot. Um, so in certain areas, yeah, you probably wouldn't want to. Overall, it's still a, a great use of habitat space. And then as far as the cemeteries and parks, um, I would be all for that. I don't know if a lot of people would like the cemeteries only because everybody likes their cemeteries to be like, you know, just grass, nothing, nothing else kind of thing. So I think pollinator and wildflowers are beautiful, but other people apparently need to rethink beautiful the way I do. That's all. Um, and then parks, sometimes we try. We, everyone, everyone that works in the monarch poll pollinator in the field tries to get and work with all the local parks. I mean, we work with uh, Department of Conservation, even though they're not parks, they're conservation areas. But, you know, similar thing, but we, well, I'm trying to work with Jeff City, we work with Columbia, Kansas City, St. Louis, so we do try, to, it's a little tougher to, to, to reach out to the individual parks just because of how they're owned and managed, et cetera, et cetera, and there's usually a lower budget for those. So hopefully that answers your question, Jim. <laughs> All right, thank you, Donna Marie. Um, I believe the next mm -hmm. question will probably be for you as well. Is it necessary to create passageways where there is no agriculture or chemical treatments through the three countries? So I assume that means do we need continuous habitat from Mexico to the United States all the way to Canada and back? So it's not that it's necessary, but it would be ideal, obviously. Um, there's a there's what they call the I I-35 corridor, which um, runs almost from you know, northern Mexico up to Canada. It crosses the northwest corner only in Missouri. But um, because that is almost a straight corridor through, a lot of funding, a lot of projects are enhancing along that corridor, along that, that basically that um, thought that you, that you had. So it'd be ideal if we could. Well, that kind of phases into the next question here. Um, does the adopt a highway program allow for roadside plantings? Um, it does. And I, I, I will be honest, so I don't know a lot about the adopt a highway. The only reason I know this is because I just recently was at Missouri Wildflower um, Nursery and Merv Wallace had pictures, postings, whatever, of, I guess, a part of the highway that they adopted. Um, and then they planted the wildflower. So I know that they allow it because they adopted a section of it, but I can't give you any other details on that other than that. Well, for me, that's a big one, Donna Marie, because I get to drive past a couple of those on my way to work every day. And there is a time in the spring where they are absolutely gorgeous and it makes my drive wonderful. I agree. So um, are there any other questions that have not been asked that are out there? Um, I'll make a few concluding statements and we'll watch for those if they roll in. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone again for attending, um, all the attendees and especially our panelists. Uh, we have spent many, many hours preparing for this talk. And Wes, we certainly look forward to uh, this fall when the plantings will go in and hopefully next year we'll get to see some of the beautiful plants that have been growing there and look forward to all the wonderful things that this grant will provide for not only the park, but for the monarch butterfly and the habitat. So um, I don't see any other questions. This video has been recorded and will be posted to CFM's YouTube channel. So you can search for it there and I'll certainly share it on our social media. Um, any concluding statements from our panelists? Seeing some shaking heads, no. Other than just, I'll just say great habitat, plant habitat. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to add and one I'll thing in there. That. I'll go ahead, Luke. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Sorry. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, you know, if you're looking at those seed mixes and, and with that question, uh, the person asked about those seed mixes for small things. It, I don't want that, uh, you know, there's a lot of different plants that'll be good to have in a seed mix. But if you are not sure what to plant, again, you can get some advice. But if you just talk with those seed dealers, even if you just go and buy it on your own and look for something, they will have mix and just say, hey, I need a monarch mix. And they're going to have stuff that either has all those requirements that I've mentioned on there or is very close to that. And you can kind of play within that what you want. But anyways, just wanted people to know it's not a 
worry too much about that because uh, they, they kind of take care of that for you. All right. I'd like to say thank you for everybody and attending and uh, hopefully we've inspired you to try to plant some in your own backyard and there's a lot of help out there for you guys and, and, and everybody. So don't be shy and ask questions and, and uh, hope to see you out there too. Patrick. And I'll just say ditto to everybody else. Um, and, and thank you uh, for all of you who attended and spending an hour plus with us learning about the Monarch and, and how to create habitat. We, we appreciate your time. Yep. Thank so you. make sure and get out to Merrimack Spring Park and uh, visit the websites of the people on the call, National Wildlife Federation, Missouri Department of Conservation, Missourians for Monarchs, and James Foundation and Merrimack Springs and Conservation Federation of Missouri. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening.